let's pick back up in 1 Corinthians 2.14. We we're talking about the mind of the spiritually dead <clears throat> person versus the mind, we would call it, of a born-again person. Or, you know, when you say mind of a born-again person, we're not, we're not just talking about the organ in the brain. We're talking about a mind that has been renewed to whatever degree to the written word of God. The mind of the senses is a spiritually dead person mind. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But you know, over the course of 50 years, I've come across plenty of born again people and they didn't understand the basic spiritual, basic spiritual concepts because you can take a redeemed person, a born again person, but if they're not renewing their mind to the Word of God, Romans 12, 2, Joshua 1, 8. Well, uh, simple concepts from the Bible seem foolishness to them. So there's only one attitude to take toward the spiritually dead or the mentally blinded, and that is they cannot enjoy the riches that belong to them until they act intelligently upon the Word. We, I think it was two weeks ago we gave you Romans 10 that... To be born again, we must believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. We must confess with our mouth. Well, that's taking action. In other words, I believe, then I take action. That's how I'm born again. But that's, that's true on all these promises in the Word of God. I've got to find a way to take action on the written Word of God. John Osteen used to teach us that our job is to give people an opportunity to take action on the Word of God in services. And... You know, there's, there's very, there are a variety of ways to do that. Of course, offerings are one. But find a way to take action on the Word of God. I'm going to give you an example here toward the end. So the natural man cannot understand or appreciate the things of God, however hungry he or she may be for them. Uh, but once they recognize what God has made available to them, well, then they can take action and appropriate that for themselves. It's like Philippians 4.19 last week in the week of increase. I said it does not apply to everybody, but it is available to everybody. And that's true of all of this. Uh, salvation does not apply to everybody, but it's available to everybody. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, it doesn't apply to everybody, but it is available to everybody. And that's true of all that God has for us because God is no respecter of persons. We know this from both the Old and New Testaments. So all the unbeliever has to do is act upon the word and the promises, the benefits become theirs. But that's true of the believer also. But what breaks my heart is how many people sit in church and nobody ever tells them about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Nobody ever tells them about healing. Nobody ever tells them about uh, how God wants to bless us even financially. So one of the most dangerous habits that Christians have is treating the Bible as though it were a common book. In one breath, we declare that we believe it to be the revelation of God. And yet the first thing we do is turn to the arm of the flesh when we have some kind of attack uh, come against us. We treat the fact of redemption as though it were a beautiful fiction. So we read about the word. We read about the word. You know, when you read about the word, that's not the same as reading the word. And Sue and I love great Christians' books. We do. But you cannot allow reading great Christian books to be a substitute for actually reading the Bible. We sing hymns confessing the word, and yet so many live under the dominion of the adversary, continually confessing sickness, want, fear, weakness, and doubts in the face of this revelation from God, our redemption of the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ and the fact that he is seated right now at the right hand of God in the heavenly realms and that all of this is a finished work that perfectly satisfies the demands of justice and meets the needs of people. It's all available. You know, it breaks my heart because about a month back, somebody walked the aisle and they introduced them to me after the service in the fellowship atrium and 
they'd never heard the gospel. They had never heard the gospel. And we think, well, this is the United States of America. Everybody's heard the gospel. But not everybody's heard the, the gospel. And what's sad to me is now you can go to church and not hear the gospel. You can go to church. Uh, somebody told me that they were witnessing to an individual and the individual decided, okay, they're going to go to church. It was something like more than two years before the church that they started going to gave an altar call. More than two years. And, and the sad thing is, this, I think it was a young man, instantly responded and, and gave his heart to Christ. But it was two, two years walking in darkness for no reason. You cannot believe God any further than your knowledge of the word of God. Tell your neighbor, you cannot believe God any further than your knowledge of the word of God. So we read, we, we read about the word, we talk about the word, and then we act like it's a fable. And this is the reason why the church has as much sickness and disease as any other organization, why, church, why faith is weak, why the average believer is ruled by the adversary, the divorce rate's no different among Christians as it is among non-Christians. You know, we should be the healthiest demographic. We should be the wealthiest demographic. We should be, you know, in every metric, we should be ahead. And yet you don't see it. Now, all this could be changed is, is if we would give the word of God the exact same place as if Jesus were here. <laughs> Although I think I've met believers that would, you know, tell them they disagreed with him on this or that. But, I mean, think about it. These are the days of the Holy Spirit. But back then, 2,000 years ago, those were the days, not of the Holy Spirit, those were the days of Jesus. And so we just, Sunday dealt with a passage, Peter goes to Jesus about taxes. And Jesus tells him what to do. And then Peter does an amazing thing. He does what Jesus says do, and he got his taxes paid, and Jesus' taxes paid. All right, two things about that. One, what if he had not believed Jesus or disagreed with Jesus or not taken action on what Jesus said? But wait a minute. How do we conduct ourselves today? You know, in John 17, 17, Jesus said, Thy word is truth. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with, was with God. The word was God. So Jesus is the word. But we don't act like it. I mean, what is the difference? I mean, if Jesus was standing here and he said to you, because you know, you're facing some challenge, some problem, and Jesus said to you, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What is the difference between that and it being in the Gospels? Is there any difference between that and it being in the Gospels? None whatsoever. But see, because, because it's, it's on written pages in a book, we find reasons to disagree with it or we find reasons to justify not taking action on that or we, find, we make excuses. Simple things, simple things that, that people just don't take action on. I mean, it's just simple things. So we could avoid all of our troubles if we would give the word of God the same place we would give Christ if he were here physically with us. Because when, when you find something in the Bible, it is God. Tell your neighbor, the Bible, the Bible is, God is God speaking to me, speaking to me. and the Bible is God, God speaking, to you. speaking to you. It's the same thing. So we are in our words. Our words are born in us. Our words are a part of us. We live in our words and our words live in others. We know each other by our words. Our words are ourselves. We are what we say. Words are given to express ourselves. The Bible is born of God. He gave birth to it. He gave life to his own word. God is in his word. God is in his word. We know 
God by his word. We, 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 we know his will by his word. God has expressed himself in his word. And God lives in his word upon our lips. When his word comes out of our mouth, it has power. It has power. Like no, others, no other word strung together in any kind of structure has power. When we quote his word, it has power. This sets Jesus free to heal, to save, and to bless. So Jesus is in the word. Jesus lives in the word, and the word lives in us. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. It's all about the word. It's all about the word. The word should have the lordship over us and over our decision making and over our lifestyle. Now, this is the fundamental thing to say to, for me to say tonight. The word should have the lordship over us and over our decision making and over our lifestyle. But listen, it is appalling how people violate the word. I mean, I'm just amazed. I mean, for, you know, something I came across and refreshed my memory on the other day, I don't have the reference, but the Bible says if you repay evil for good, evil will never leave your house. And people do this all the time. You show kindness to someone. You give money to someone when they're in need and they turn around and repay you with evil. The Bible says evil will, will never leave their house. I don't know about you, but I sure enough don't need evil not ever leaving my house. Amen. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Man, I'm going to get back at them. And I'm from Detroit. You know, this is my natural inclination. I just, I just have to, by an act of my will, set that aside. Sometimes, rarely, sometimes, I say, Lord, I'm going to, I just give that to you. And actually, as I've put some decades on, I realize that I don't even have to do that. If I will take no action, the Lord takes action. But see, when I take action, when I take matters into my own hands, well, then... He's not obligated to. Remember, was it about three, three weeks back, I gave you some names, names of God, and one of them was Jehovah Nisi. He's the Lord God, our banner. He's the Lord God, our victory. Amen. He's the Lord God who fights our battles. See, if, if we don't believe that, we fight our battles. Amen. Yeah. The lordship of the word. But, but people, I'm telling you what, man, it's just shocking to me how even in the ministry, people, people just don't go by the Bible. They just don't do what the Bible says. It's amazing to me. And, and in this culture, see, it's all about how people feel. It's all about, it's all about e e evoking a, an emotional response. But it shouldn't be about that. We should not relate to each other as believers based on evoking an emotional response. A lot of ministry today is geared to the vulnerable. A lot of ministry today is geared to the emotional. And actually, a lot of ministry today is geared to the hysterical. But it shouldn't be. One thing I learned from one of my daddies in the faith, Fred Price, is that the ministry of the Word of God should be targeted to your spirit man, but it also needs to be presented in such a way to where even an unsaved man can understand what I'm saying. It needs to be packaged in a way to where someone even can get it with their mind. Right before he died, Edwin Lewis Cole and called, called us up, said, hey, I want to have lunch with you. So we, we met Edwin Lewis Cole and Nancy for lunch, and he said, he said, you make God's case like an attorney. He said, you lay the case out like an attorney. 
See, and, and I learned that from Fred Price. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and, you know, act crazy and evoke emotional response from you because that will not pay your rent in August. That will not get your body healed. That will not set you free from an affliction. Can you see that? And if we need entertainment, you know, a church is the worst place to go to get entertainment. You know, there's plenty of entertainers in the world. Why go to church? No, but I'm speaking to your spirit, man. But I'm also speaking to your mind. And that's why I present my case for the word of God the way I do. Because we never know who's among us. You know, the extreme of that, Paul wrote to the Corinthians about that. You could scream and yell all the whole service time in tongues. Well, who's going to understand you? But listen, some of these things, you know, people send me links to things occasionally. And I, I watch three minutes and I can't, you know, it's like my head's going to explode. Because they're not speaking to my spirit man and they're not speaking to my mind. They're, they're talking to hysterical people. They're talking to emotional people. They're talking to vulnerable people. They're trying to take advantage of vulnerable people. But there's no victory in any of that. Amen. The only victory is going to come from deep within you, inside you, in your spirit, man. As you hear the word of God, you believe the word of God, you confess the word of God, and you take action on it. Now, I'm fully aware that when I say something like that, people think, yeah, but, you know, I want to go somewhere where we can swing from the chandelier. Look, I, I've, I've been around all those people nobody ever has any money they're all sick all the time I'm not bragging it's just the reality when have you you've been here a while when have you ever heard me say uh, you know is any sick among you let them call for the elders of the church when have you ever heard me say uh, I, need a, I need a group of you guys come up here and lay hands on me when have you ever heard that well, you know why? Because I've been saved more than three days. I've been, in other words, we're supposed to be growing. Now, there's nothing wrong with having somebody lay hands on you. Absolutely nothing. But people that need hands laid on them 52 times a year, where, where's the growth factor? Talk to me, people. Where's the growth factor? I mean, 52 weeks... Shouldn't, shouldn't I have a week of victory in there somewhere? Isn't there a pony in there for, the, for me somewhere? See, what I'm saying is a lot of ministry is geared to vulnerable people, emotional people, hysterical people. But there's no victory in it, none that I've ever seen. There's no victory in it, none that I've ever seen. Somebody asked Fred Price, you know, how long do I have to confess these things? He said, well, as long as you want it to work. As long as you want it to work. Let them say continually. We gave you that scripture in the week of increase. Let them say continually. Well, how long do I have to say this stuff? Continually. As long as you want it to work. And the same people that would complain about taking action on the word of God, for example, confessing healing scriptures, confessing prosperity scriptures, they'll obey every charlatan every January on a Daniel fast. They'll follow the rules. You can have, you know, you can have a pizza with beans, but you can't have a pizza with pepperoni. I mean, they'll follow the rules. But when you come along and say, you know, can find the scriptures that cover your situation, two or three, at least two or three, and then you memorize them and you commit them to memory. And every time, you, every time you have a concern about that, every time it comes to your mind and let it come to your mind, then rehearse the word and what the word has to say about your situation. Well, they don't want to do that. They want to drink anointing oil. I've never seen anybody healed from drinking anointing oil. It's amazing. I'm, I'm ashamed. What is in Washington, D.C. is in the churches. What is in Washington, D.C. Washington, is in the ministry.
And, and I personally don't take offense at it because, you know, it, it doesn't bother me, but I, I feel bad for people because they get caught up in all of that. And there's no victory in it. 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 I mean, look at me. No gifting, no talent, B plus student. I got a hell of a, way, a long way down the road. Or I got a heaven a long way down the road. <laughs> I don't even own a company. Some of you here tonight, you own a company. Think of it. See? And so, you know, here's old Dr. Gene. I'm just plodding along. My God's meeting all of my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. What comes next? He's making me rich in every way so I can be generous on every occasion. What comes next? The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow to it. What comes next? He who gives to the poor shall act no good thing. And, you know, just, just doing my thing, doing my thing methodically, right? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Line upon line, year after year, just cash is going up, debt's going down. By what? By what? By what? Being consistent and doing the word of God. But see, people want a shortcut. But there are no shortcuts. John Osteen, I loved him. I mean, he was like the preeminent pastor of my lifetime. And John Osteen used to stand up and say, we got no shortcuts because there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. We, we don't teach any shortcuts because there aren't any shortcuts. Now, 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 you know, somebody... <laughs> reminded me Sunday of something I'd forgotten. I mean, most everything I've ever done forgot, I forgot about. But a man told me Sunday, you know, it's really weird how he has 20-20 vision in one eye and, uh, and not the other. But years and years ago, he was having trouble with that eye and asked me to pray for him and I laid hands on him. And he's had 20-20 vision ever since in that one eye. He said, why didn't I ask you to pray for both eyes? So, Thank God for that. I love quick. Do you understand? I love it. But it doesn't always work like that. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you just got to, you know, pull out Colossians 2.15 and Galatians 3.13 and run the devil off. Sometimes you just have to take the long route because there, there, there is no shortcut. And if we don't know who we are in Christ, if we haven't been somewhere and been taught who we are in Christ, how do we know what to do in the first place? See, I would rather teach you who you are in Christ and what you are in Christ and what you possess in Christ and what you can do in Christ than to put on a show every time we meet together and, and, and have a crazy going on because there's no victory in the show. The victory is in you knowing who you are and not letting the devil run you. Right. Can you see that? Yes. And then, <laughs> let's go over to the, you know, the forbidden zone. You know, people just don't, they, they just don't do the word of God on child rearing. They just do not do the word of God on child rearing. And then, this plays out, this ministry geared toward hysteria plays out in that realm you know if if i act crazy enough if i get if i do enough daniel fast if I, whatever that then then somehow my kid will come back from the brink of hell i've never seen it happen never one time man you got to know who you are in christ you have to you have to find the scriptures to cover your situation but the best thing to do is is forget about all that the best thing to do is just not go down that road and, and do child rearing biblically. Do child rearing biblically. Then I avoid all that. You know, one reason I'm able to be a blessing to my, my grown children the way I am and my grandchildren is I've never spent any money on lawyers for them, you know, as far as uh, getting them out of jail or getting them out of D DUIs or any of that. I've never spent any money on divorce lawyers, never spent any money on custody battles, never, never spent any money on any of that. I've, I've been able to use all of that money a lot of people spend on all that stuff and, and give it to my, to my family. 
And it's easier. You know, and, and I, I made this, listen, I made this a mission in my life because when my mom was alive, it was, it was drama, 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 and it was all self-created. We got, back in those days, it wasn't email, it would have been a postcard, but we got a postcard, the Grand Wilaya in Hawaii was opening up early because they actually finished construction on the hotel early, that was in Maui, and it was half, half price, I thought, wow. So, you know, I booked us, and I, I booked a room for my mom, and uh, right before we left, she said, well, I can't go, she made up some story, it was a lie, but when, when we got back from Ohio, found out was she married this guy. Man, you talk about a retread. This guy was a retread on a retread on a retread on a retread on a retread. <laughs> and then for years, it was, it was just trouble, 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 trouble. What do you think about that? I said, well, it doesn't matter what I think about it. You did it. Yeah, but what do you think about it? Doesn't matter what I think about it, because you did it. Yeah, but what do you think about it? I said, it doesn't matter what you did, what I think about it, because now you're in a brand new covenant. Yeah, but what do you think about it? And finally, I just told her, I said, I, I have no opinion about it whatsoever. If you want to know what I think about it, you, lo you look up what the Apostle Paul has to say about it. I have no opinion about it. I have no personal opinion about it. Well, of course, no, nobody wants to do this. Nobody's interested in what the Apostle Paul says about anything. <laughs> this is the power. This is the power of Christian living. Now, look, you may be here tonight and, and made mistakes. I get it. You know who hasn't made mistakes? Nobody but Jesus. So I get it. The thing to do is just pick up from this point forward and don't make those mistakes. That's all any of us can do. And thank God for 1 John 1, 9, that we can confess our sins and be forgiven of our sins. Thank God for it. Amen. Amen. Nobody has a time machine. Can't go back. But I can, I can find scriptures that cover my situation right now and, and I can begin to live by them and Believe them and confess them and take action upon them. Amen? Amen. I, I would like to have a time machine as much as anybody, but, you know, that's, that, that's not realistic. That doesn't help any of us. But to these young couples, you know, do the word, brother. Do the word. Amen. Get, get a dowel rod. Not, what, what, older, older, older. And, you know, you know, bring correction biblically, never in anger. Look, if, if, you, if you put in the time and the effort and do things God's way, you don't have trouble later. I don't know about you, but I like not having trouble later. Amen. Tell your neighbor, I like not having trouble later. Yeah, I don't want any trouble. Amen. And she was a hoot. She'd call me up. You know, uh, you know, she called his name. He's trying to get me to buy this piece of land, you know, for five times what it's worth. I said, well, you did it. You know, I'm a lot of help. You did it. What am I going to do about it? When she got married, our, our attorney back then was so funny. Is when he, he, you know, his first thing out of his mouth when he found out she got remarried, he said, estate planning is over. People don't think about what they're, I mean, they don't think through the ramifications of what they're doing. Amen. People are funny. You know, all I want to do, and, and I, I know we have church members, you know, man, they're going on these exotic destinations and they're going over here. And, I mean, it's amazing. I, I see, Sue tells me about Facebook and where people are. Y'all must be rich. <laughs> And, uh, but I'm at a stage of life where, you know, when I see an ad or some hotel or some cruise or, you know, Eiffel Tower or whatever, I just ask myself a simple question and it answers everything. Would I rather do that or would I rather go have a cheeseburger with one of my grandchildren? 
and that answers every question. And then it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper. And, you know, they're happy. You know, it's just so easy to make them happy. So here are some notes I made to myself on May 31. The Lord is speaking to me today about taking him at his word. This was May 31. To most, the Bible is a book of suggestions. When people read something like this in the Bible, to them, it's merely a suggestion. And so right here is why Faith Christian Center has never taken any government money. Genesis 14, 22, but Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord God, most high creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say I made Abram rich. And I, I made these notes to myself on May 31, but to those who are committed to doing the word, it is a command, it's a code to live by. See, when people read something like this in the Bible, to them it's merely a suggestion, or maybe it's not even a suggestion to them. Maybe they just think it's part of a story. But I go to Romans 4, I find out that Abraham is the father of my faith. And so when I read something like that, it's not a, to me it's not a story, it's not a suggestion, it's a command, it's a code lived by. I'm not taking anything from him. Can you see it? And when I, May 31st, I said, when I got done praying this morning, I told Sue, I don't think we even realize what God did among us in 2020 and how we walked in the power of God in 2020. You know, we've been teaching on righteousness and Genesis 15, 6 says, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. It's astounding when you think about what happened to most of America in 2020. 100,000 evangelical churches closed their doors forever the next year in 2021. The extent to which we walk in the righteousness of God and the extent to which we walk in the power of God is the extent to which we take him at his word and the extent to which we obey his word. Now, I just used a dirty word there, four-letter word. I know, I know in 2023, you know, that's taboo. But I think... You know, because we want a revival, right? We want revival. We want to see God shake this nation with revival. Well, how are, we going, how are we going to see God move? And how are we going to see God shake this nation with revival if we don't return to some old school concepts? You know, when I, the reason, I, I don't even know that I, I did this on purpose, but I came up, well, I didn't come up with it. James came up with it to be a doer of the word of God. Okay, when I say to be a doer of the word of God, or James says, the, the apostle James says, to be a doer of the word of God, what is a synonym for that? Talk to me, what is a synonym? Take action. Huh? Take action. Take action, well, that, we learned that here too, but what's a, what's, another, what's a biblical synonym for be a doer of the word of God? Oh. Obey. Yeah. Obey. Obey. And think about how all you have to do to realize the extent to which the concept of obedience has totally gone out the window is go visit the local mall. Young people, nobody goes to the mall anymore. You know why Amazon's so huge? Because everybody's afraid to go to the mall. You know, I mean, those kids are running around like a pack of wolves. Who has not set foot in the mall since COVID? I got my hand up. Has not set foot in the mall since COVID. It's, it's probably, looks like 5%. Nobody wants to go to the mall. Face that. And we're in Texas. Can you imagine going to the mall in New York City, brother? <laughs> You'd need body armor so you wouldn't get stabbed, you know, when they're looting Nordstrom's or whatever. Anybody been to a four-way stop recently? <laughs> Talk to me. Anybody been through a four-way stop recently? Yes. How is everybody at obeying the rules? <laughs> Talk to me. <laughs> it's mayhem. Well, that, that mayhem, see, the problem is we, we might understand mayhem in the culture, but should there be mayhem in the church? No. 
We under, how about this? We understand grifting in government, but should there be grifting in the ministry? We understand using people in government, but should, should people be using people in the ministry? It's over $300 million that guy raised on, you know, stop the steal. And people are still in prison over that. I know maybe somebody doesn't like me bringing it up, but that's a lot of money. That's a third of a billion dollars. And, you know, it comes out... yeah, the problem with all this court stuff is stuff, stuff comes out and stuff will come out. But, you know, the aides were saying it wasn't stolen, it wasn't stolen, it wasn't stolen. But, you know, social media today, you know. Yeah, but, you know, they did all those mail-in ballots. Well, who approved all that? You know, if I'm playing checkers on a chessboard and you beat me, that's not really your fault. Using people. That's my point. Using people. Lady told me today, she took her teenager in for the annual physical before school starts. And the pediatrician wants to know, do you want us to run a EKG? Pediatrician. And people can't connect the dots before the what was it called? The rush on the drugs? Warp speed. Before before warp speed, there's never been a pediatrician in the history of the world ever ask a, a, a parent, do you want us to run an EKG on your teenager? But now this is like gonna be normal procedure. Using people. I have a real problem with using people. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Such a simple concept. Isn't it? It's almost too simple. It's so simple. (laughs) This saying is so simple and so beautiful, a genius must have thought it up. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But man, people don't take action on the word. They don't obey the word. Then here comes all this trouble. I don't think most Christians understand a handful of facts. Here's a handful of facts. Most Christians don't understand. It's not really about this life. It's about the next life. It's not really about this life. It's about the next life. It's not really about this life. This is just, just this, all this is, is to see who's fit to live in God's city. That's all this is. But the fact that it lasts 60, 70, 80, 90 years throws us. I mean, in, in the perspective of eternity, your life, even if it's 90 years, is the equivalent of sitting for an SAT. Because eternity is a long time. This all this is. You know, everybody, everybody needs to go back and read, reread Pilgrim's Progress. We're, we're, we're not residents here. We're aliens and strangers. So we shouldn't act like the world, talk like the world, behave like the world. We're passing through. This is not our home. And I'm in this strange place now in my life where the things of God are more real to me than the things of this world. 
It's a strange place to be in my life because I see all this stuff going on and I... It's like I'm watching a video tour of some kind of crazy fun house on October 31st and I can't relate to it. But I can relate to the things of God, the city of God. It's all very real to me. But the things of this world... I'm just passing through. And if we, would have, if we would have that perspective, it changes everything. Can't take advantage of people. Can't lie, cheat, steal, rip people off. If I have the perspective that I'm just passing through, I'm just a pilgrim passing through, that's it. I'm just on my way. I'm just passing through. I'm going to enjoy the time I got. And then I'd be gone. Amen. But most Christians don't seem to understand that. I mean, they just keep, they just keep living like this is it. It's all here. No, 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 it's not. It'd be, that'd be like going to Disney World and, and, and hanging out and living there and, and thinking you're going to, you know, live in the tower with the princess, princess and all that stuff. You're, they're just, they're dreaming. There's something coming that is way, way, way beyond this. And this is simply to see who's fit to live in his city. That's all it is. That's all it is. Yeah, but pastor, you know, you, know, you, you don't have any debt and you, and you can't relate and all that. Let me tell you what, you don't know what you're talking about. It has been one heck of a, of a fight. It, there's nothing, any, no, nothing came free. Nothing came easy. Nobody handed us nothing. Well, yeah, but you know, people, you know, you, you talk about Sunday, you know, people do hand you money and all that. Well, that was after 50 years. When I started preaching in, in the summer of 1973, People have no idea, and they want to come along and judge us. We came back from Africa, and we did, we spoke four nights at a church in Burleson. We did a marriage seminar. I preached Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. We did a marriage seminar, the successful marriage. After I preached Sunday morning, they took us to lunch and when the meeting was over Wednesday night 1982 I'd have been 25 years old is that right 20, 26 years old meeting is over Wednesday night we go in the pastor's office it's all done I have worked four days I have driven a Lincoln Mark 5 from North Arlington to Burleson Five times, and they gave us one sack of canned goods. And they took an offering Sunday morning. They took an offering Sunday morning. They took an offering Sunday night. They took an offering Monday night. They took an offering Tuesday night, and they took an offering Wednesday night. So when you see God blessing me, this is just ketchup, baby. We're just doing a little ketchup now. <laughs> Amen. No. I, uh, at, at Kathy Mink's memorial, I met a man I'd never met before. What's his name? The guy from Tulsa Guts Church. Anyway, I met him. And uh, made a remarkable impression on me. But uh, I used the term... You know, we pioneered our church in 1984, and he chuckled. He said, I'm so glad to hear somebody say that they pioneered their church because he said, now everybody says they planted their church. He said, I, I never used that term because he said it wasn't easy. Planting a church makes it sound like it's so easy. He said, he said it was like gnawing through concrete. <laughs> I said, absolutely. He's a good guy. 
and then they don't understand this, there will be a reckoning. Tell your neighbor, there will be a reckoning. reckoning. Tell the neighbor on the other side, there will be a reckoning. reckoning. We're going to be judged. And the Bible specifically says, and why nobody's alarmed at it, you know, it's on my mind quite often, but that those of us who teach and preach the word of God will be judged more harshly. But people just seem not to be aware of that. And then then here's something else God's people don't seem to be aware of. Every verse in the Bible is true. And you don't want to get on the wrong side of any of it. I just gave an example about 10 minutes ago. Whoever pays back evil for good, if anyone pays back evil for good, evil will never leave their house. See, that's true. That's true whether you believe it. That's true whether you get on the right side of it. And that's true whether you get on the wrong side of it. But I... I couldn't count the times. I have no recollection. I mean, there's no way. I remember there was this couple, young couple, and uh, we went there after the birth of their first child. Uh, You know, the the best food in the universe. Now, every guy in the church probably feels the same way, but with a different objective. But, you know, to me, the best food in the universe is food that's soup cooked. And, I mean, think about it. I mean, she cooked a meal for this couple. And we go over there, drive all the way out there to North Fort Worth. We, we, and, 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 man, they just tore into us about calling her Pastor Sue. And the mother, some, one of their mothers was there. What a nasty piece of work she was. And uh, just tore into us. Well, couldn't you wait a week or two and let's get past the food. Let's get past this pastoral visit. How about that? And, and we never got our Tupperware back. <laughs> so returning evil for good. The pastor I worked for wanted me to go visit a rich man's daughter in the church. She was in the hospital. Sue, Sue didn't feel comfortable going with me. And did you wait in the car or the lobby? I was pregnant, yeah. You were pregnant? Were you in the car or the lobby? the lobby? The lobby. I go up there. Well, she apparently was upset because she didn't have her makeup on. I mean, cussed me up one side and down the other. I, could, I, I mean, it, it wouldn't be 1,000 times. It'd have to be 10,000. And God's people. See? And what you don't read in the Bible, you don't even have a chance of obeying. If you never read the Bible, and and it's not all good stuff in there. If a man repays evil for good, evil will never leave his house. But if you don't read that, you don't know that. So every verse in the Bible is true, and you don't want to get on the wrong side of any of it. And then... The last one that people don't seem to realize is God's people simply have no comprehension of the power of walking in love. They, they simply do not understand the awesome power of walking in love. They simply do not understand the awesome power of walking in love. You know, we had three special young men in the church. No, four. And uh, two have moved on to other things, other places. It's kind of sad to me, but they put them in Section 8 housing and they get an EBT on their card and then they, the family dumps them off. But here we are at Faith Christian Center, so they come. That's great. It's wonderful. You may wonder, you probably don't wonder why I do what I do, but these special people when they get to heaven, they're going to have all their faculties and they're going to remember how you treated them. I go out of my way to be kind. And that right there makes me different than a lot of pastors because a lot of pastors, man, they're not going to be kind to anybody except somebody who can give them money. I go out of my way to be kind. 
People been to prison. I go out of my way to be kind. I, I can't comprehend that. What would that be like? Spend a decade or two decades in prison. I go out of my way to be kind. I go out of my way to be kind. People simply do, God's people do not understand the awesome, incredible power of walking in love. It's all, you read John 17, it's really all he wanted from us was for us to love him and to love one another. But people don't understand that. Say it out loud. I'm going to do a better job of walking in love. Let me tell you what, something else about walking in love. We don't know, God doesn't know the extent to which you walk in love by the way you treat people that you do business with or the way you treat people that you can make money off of. God knows the extent to which you walk in love by how you treat people that you'll never see again and cannot do a doggone thing for you. I'm a very imperfect man, but I've done my best. We were in, we had crossed over from Austria to Germany in 1982. We, were, we had come out of Africa and we were bumming around Europe for a month. I knew I'd never have the opportunity again. And so we bought the book, Seeing Europe on $15 a day. We were staying in guest houses and whatever. And we had, we had crossed over, but that was before the Euro. And we had crossed over from Austria to Germany, and I didn't calculate the tip right, because you know we, we had switched money from Austria to German, and I didn't calculate the tip right, and we were missionaries. We were missionaries. 1982, we'd have been 26 years old. We were missionaries. And that German gal comes running out of that restaurant, you know, and, uh, sir, did you mean to leave this? This is too much. This is too much. And quickly, all of a sudden, you know, it was like electric shock treatment. All of a sudden, my mind became clear, and, and the exchange rate became clear, and I realized what I'd done. I'd left her about a $53 tip. And I said, no, you keep it. God bless you. You may say that's extreme. I am not going to ask a working person for money back. I'm not going to do it. So calculate those numbers. 